If we could get everyone gathered here, we've got a fairly full agenda here and we'd like to get started. I want to welcome everyone here to the um, annual spring benefit for the CPC of Northwest Ohio. My name is Tim Hogan. I'm, I'm, pr I'm privileged to be on the board of the CPC. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was a little boy, well, even recently, going to movies, you know, or you go to a presentation, the announcer will come on and say, sit down, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Well, I'm not going to do that today because that's not our objective. You know, this past weekend in Sri Lanka, we had about 290 people who were killed, and a lot of them were our brothers and sisters in Christ. And they were targeted on, of all days, Resurrection Sunday, when they were celebrating the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, who were here for. And a hardline Buddhist monk in Sri Lanka said this, and I quote, we see how these radical Christian groups in the West come here and try to convert Buddhists. We cannot allow this to happen anymore, unquote. And then the New York Times is quoted as saying, we are told that Christianity causes tension in that region because there are rapid rise of conversions have created tensions from India to Indonesia because evangelical Christians have found fertile ground across Asia. Al Mohler this morning on the briefing said, and I quote, non-conversionist -conver Christianity actually is not Christianity. You see, Christianity and the Christian gospel is about the call to conversion. That was a God, Christ's great commission. Christianity is not a spectator sport. So when I say, if I were to tell you to sit back and relax and enjoy yourself, I wouldn't be true. And as we go through the presentation here, and while this is a spring benefit for, for monetary reasons, you know, there's much more that you can do for CPC. I want you to be thinking in your mind if God is calling you to become involved in whatever way. This is very much a people business. The volunteers are human beings. The board are human beings. Our executive director is a human being. All our clients are human beings. This is a people business. And we need to be about our father's business. And to that, the CPC mission statement is this. CPC, Women's Health Resource, is a Christian social service agency that exists to share the gospel of Christ, provide free assistance for unplanned pregnancies, help to heal and restore those experiencing post-abortion trauma, test for sexually transmitted diseases, and advocate sexual abstinence until marriage through education. Bow with me in prayer, because that always seems to be a good place to start. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you now with very grateful hearts, but also heavy hearts, because we know, as the Bible says, the work is vast, but the laborers are few. And we pray for our brothers and sisters over in Sri Lanka who lost many. I was listening on the news today. Funerals are going on all across that country for people who died senselessly. But, but we also recognize that our job in here, that we're not called to just be bystanders. We are called to proclaim the gospel. And Lord, I thank you for this organization, CPC, where we, administer, where we minister to people's physical needs, but beyond even that, and, more, and much more importantly, is spiritual needs to bring people to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. So we pray for this evening. We pray for um, the, the schedule, for the presenters. Lord, I just pray that they will be bold in speaking the truth of, in love and, and that all that we say or do here will bring honor to your name, for it is your name, Jesus that we are here. In Jesus' name, amen.
Well, good evening. I, too, would like to extend a very warm welcome to you. Thanks for being here. We know that uh, in any given time, there are a ton of things that are on people's agenda and wrestling with schedules and trying to figure out what sort of makes the list. And uh, so your presence here tonight is appreciated for sure. And I will echo what Dr. Hogan said with respect to the lives of people that were uh, having an impact with. Uh, we, we appreciate the opportunity that God has afforded us. We want to seize those opportunities well. We want to steward the ministry that he has entrusted to us well. And at the end of the day, we hope there's an effectiveness uh, and a harvest that comes from the work that we do. So we're very, very grateful. I am grateful for the food. I hope you are as well. I hope you had uh, plenty to eat out there. Uh, the brisket, if you didn't have it, was quite delicious. Uh, the other food, likewise, is good. I don't know how much is left over, but there may even be some if you have some interest afterwards. I think we might have uh, some available for, for purchase. Um, and I hope as well you got a number and you were bidding on plenty of items. And you're probably wondering as you're sitting here, did I win that? Am I the highest bidder or did somebody sneak in after me to, to make it? Um, the bidding is closed, I'm sorry to say. Um, but uh, hopefully you're going to walk away with a few items. We'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. Uh, it is a very full program, um, and we're here to celebrate life. God is the author of life. He's the giver of life. Uh, we celebrate him. We celebrate his gift of life, and so we want to highlight some of that. I think the best way to sort of lift that up and to identify that is to hear stories, right? We resonate with stories. We like to hear stories on the fact that people have been touched in some way. And so um, I thought it would be best to hear that from the front line. So most of this evening's program is really just from the staff, uh, some of their stories and interactions with clients, as well as hearing from clients directly. In addition to that, we also thought it was prudent and wise for you to understand a little bit about what's going on in our culture. Certainly uh, the Supreme Court, legislation, uh, movies that are out. There's a whole lot of emphasis right now on the whole issue of life and abortion and surrounding that particular topic. And so it would be wise for us to consider what are some of the things that you don't necessarily know about what's going on. So this is a bit of an informational time as well. But all of that is intended to motivate you. It's not just simply information for the sake of you, you walk out of here a smarter person, which we're hoping that you do. But at the end of the day, as Dr. Hogan had mentioned, it's intended to motivate you to do something, to respond. What is it that I can do? How can I be involved in this? If this is what God has for me, how am I actively pursuing that which he has and doing something specifically about it? So there's that certainly as a part of this. I also want to make sure, if this is new to you, the whole pregnancy sort of center and what it is we do, I just want to do a, a bit of a flyover and break down the various components uh, that we do. And on the slide, it'll, it'll show you some of the things. First and foremost, we're about unplanned pregnancies. We're about women and men who are in a situation where they're just not sure where to go. They're, they're navigating or trying to navigate through a series of choices that are ahead of them. They're not sure that they can do this. They're not sure that they have the resources. They can't afford this. This is not the goal and vision that they had for their life. And so we're trying to help them answer the question definitively, am I pregnant? And is it a viable pregnancy? And those are medical questions. And so we have medical personnel who are helping answer those questions. So medical with respect to pregnancy. That's a big portion of what we do. Secondly, medical as well as STI and STDs. If an individual is sexually active and they think that they might have an STI, it's an opportunity for us to test them and to uh, provide some solution to the problem that they have. Medical issue and providing uh, medication to help offset that. But it's not simply a social service. Neither one of those two programs that I mentioned is simply a social service component. It's gospel focused. It's helping them understand that the series of choices that they've made ought to allow them or move them in a direction to think about some other things. And we want them to think about the bigger issues of life. And so we're leveraging these circumstances in their life with the focus of pointing them to the gospel. Not twisting, not arm twisting, not forcing, not conniving, but at least identifying some major issues that maybe they haven't thought of before. And so it affords us the opportunity to, to talk about those things, and we certainly want to do that well. Thirdly, we recognize that many women have had an abortion. If the statistics are true in America, the number of abortions is either 25% or up. And so one in four, one in five women have had an abortion in America. And if that's the case, movies like Unplanned can bring a lot of these things to the surface that maybe they didn't want to talk about before. 
And now maybe it's an opportunity for us to have a conversation with them, at least opening the door and affording them an opportunity to have a conversation in a way that can be helpful, redemptive, hopeful, something more than what they're otherwise faced with. So we want to help, and we do help women who are in that situation. And then lastly, it's an educational program. Why couldn't we have a conversation with a 13-year-old when they're 13 as opposed to 18 or, or 19, and now they're sexually active and they have an STI or they, they potentially are pregnant? Why not have those conversations well in advance of the coming in and being tested? So we want to have those conversations, and by the goodness and grace of God, we have opportunity to have those conversations in a public setting. So we have a sexual risk avoidance and SRA program called Project Respect, where we're going in for junior high and high school, and we're talking to them about issues of, of sexting and pornography and, um, and other issues that maybe they're having conversations with, but maybe with the wrong crowd and with their friends, and they're not otherwise getting good information. So we're wanting to help them think about that issue well and to understand that choices have consequences, and the consequences may not be exactly what they're looking for. So to help them think wisely about that. And so you'll hear from each one of those respective areas and get an inside look from some of the staff more specifically to identify what it is and how we do that. So those are those particular components. Um, Next, I just wanted to give you a few statistics. These are in your program as well. I won't spend a whole lot of time with them, but I just want to let you know the impact that we are having. We have four offices in Northwestern Ohio. God has been gracious to us with respect to providing that level of service. Um, and last year alone, we saw 5,600 clients or 5,600 office visits, which is about 640 individual clients. Um, we had 5,700 phone calls. We had 142 births. 142 births that we have had from women who have come in to see, uh, to see us. 41 decisions for Christ. As I mentioned, we're wanting to leverage the gospel in a way to help them think about bigger issues. And there were 41 people last year who put their faith and trust in Christ because of uh, other factors in their lives that were moving them in that direction. Um, 6,900 volunteer hours and over 5,300 units of service. Units of service would be diapers, formula, um, cribs, mattresses. Some are bigger items, some are smaller items. But these are items that we want to give to a woman who is saying, I want a parent, and I just don't have the financial resources to be able to afford a lot of the things that are necessary to parent well. And so we're providing these resources for them as they're taking parenting classes. So that's just a flyover briefly of some of the statistics that we have. I want to identify just a few of the staff people that we have and the board members. The first slide is just our board members. I thought it would be appropriate. Maybe you know what they look like today, but maybe you don't know what they look like a few years ago. Uh, so I, I'm not going to go through each of the board members respectively, but uh, they're listed there. Uh, the next slide just lists out the administrative staff um, that in large part were helpful today in making most of these things uh, possible. So grateful for them. And then the next slide I have um, that I will stop with and allow some of the other people to talk about, just the clinic staff. These are the medical personnel uh, that are dealing um, with the clients as they're coming through the door. All right, so the next person that I want to have you hear from uh, are some of the clinic staff. These are stories, again, from uh, those who are coming in pregnancy-related and how we've had an opportunity to minister to them. So Kelly Bolton will be coming, so I can identify her. Do you have somebody joining you, Kelly? Oh, yes, and Lori Yoder. Good evening. Very happy to see all of your faces here today. Hello, welcome. Thanks so much for being here. Um, Kelly is not with us officially anymore. I took her spot. She had baby number four, January. Yes. So I started at the end of August or beginning of September and um, took over for her in Wauseon. And one of the stories that we want to share tonight is a story that we shared together when Lori came to the office. It was... Um, we want to share a little bit more about just other than somebody who was possibly interested in aborting her child. We want to share a little additional into that because not, not all of the girls that are coming want to have an abortion. And we don't always want to focus just on that. We want to focus on the whole. But this story is kind of near and dear to both of our hearts because it is actually a story of somebody who was not seeing life at that time, and, but we witnessed life with her in the ultrasound room together for the first time. So it was um, kind of a busy day. I was still pretty overwhelmed because I was pretty new. Lots had happened that day, and we were waiting on a client to come in 
and it's probably about 10 till 2, and someone else walked in the door. We were actually waiting on an actual ultrasound, ultrasound client. Yeah. So when this young lady came up to our door and wanted a pregnancy test and wanted an ultrasound at that time, we knew we could possibly offer her the pregnancy test, but not the ultrasound um, due to, well, no, we, we didn't know. We actually couldn't. We couldn't do it couldn't that day, but it we knew day. just yeah. from talking to her just a little bit that she was definitely abortion-minded at mm-hmm. the time. And it's hard to send somebody out the door when you know they're abortion-minded, not knowing what's going to happen. But we weren't equipped with enough staff that day to see her, so we offered her appointment, hoping that she would come back to that appointment. And so we sat there a few more minutes and realized by this time it's like 5 or 10 after 2, and our ultrasound hasn't shown up. And we looked out the window, and she was still in the parking lot with her friend that had come with her. So I ran outside and said, our plans have changed. Can you come back in? Yep. And she said yes. Mm-hmm. So they came back in. Mm-hmm. And she was with a friend that mm-hmm. day. Mm-hmm. Um, we ran the, a pregnancy test, and it came up positive, which she already knew that she was, she was pregnant. And she was so nervous, so nervous that she did not want to have this baby because of her family, not her friends, her family. Mm-hmm. So um, at that point, we knew that she was probably still too early to uh, do an ultrasound because we don't like to do ultrasounds until they're eight weeks so that they're a little bit farther along so that we can see what we need to see on the ultrasound. Um, So we talked to her some more, um, shared with her, um, went over all of the options that she had, um, and she agreed to come back for an ultrasound. We told her she had time to think about it. She didn't have to make that decision that day. Um, and she agreed to an appointment, and so I think it was about two weeks later, um, she had an appointment, and that day I remember getting to work and thinking all day, that's all I could think about, um, is she going to show? Will she show? Will she show? All day. And that's where we want to just stop the story for the moment and thank you. Thank you for being on your knees in prayer with us. If you're not a a Bella Alert um, individual and you'd like to know more about that, or you can stand for life and pray, you are helping us. We feel your prayers. We know that the Lord is in there with us each and every day. He's going before us and he's following behind us. But your prayers, we feel your prayers, especially in these situations. Your prayers help to bring that girl back. She felt those prayers as, as we have felt those prayers. So if you don't know what she's talking about, a Bella alert, um, when we have someone come in who's abortion-minded, we send a text to Gina, and she sends out a text to anybody who gives us their phone number, their cell phone number. You'll get a text alert, and it will say, Bella, please pray. That's what that means. Any girl who's abortion-minded is just called a Bella. So when we have someone come in, we get that sent out, um, and those prayers do make a difference. And this young lady did show back for her ultrasound appointment, and she brought along a friend. Um, still very nervous to tell her family, um, still very strongly thinking that she wanted to abort the baby, um, and uh, brought her back to the ultrasound room, and we started doing the ultrasound. And I cannot tell you how much, when you go into that room, You don't have to have the words. The Holy Spirit there is providing the words on what you need to do to speak life. And when we saw that beautiful little life on the screen, she still looked at the baby and she didn't know yet if she if she could possibly do this. And um, not too often do I. We we talk to the other individuals that come into the room with these girls. But I felt a strong urge to ask her friend, "What do you think she should do?" And her friend said, I think she can do it. I think she can have this baby. Mm-hmm. And just the whole, the whole tension in the room, um, everything just changed at that point. And um, being able to see the heartbeat, being able to see a little bit of movement, I think, um, just changed her mind. And the prayers of all mm-hmm. the people who were praying that day. We're not saying that it was still something that was she was easily mm-hmm. able to go. Right. She still had a rough time telling mm-hmm. her family, but... Um, she is uh, still carrying baby. She is. And she is six weeks from delivering, and um, actually just saw her today. And she is a quiet girl, but she has come out of her shell. And um, a whole another thing that happens with this is we get the privilege of walking alongside these gals as they come. So we get to see them for weeks and weeks and weeks and um, get to know them. And it's the relationships that we form with them, too, um, that is just amazing. Um, 
and just just neat to see how she has grown um, in these seven months that we've known her. Um, I just I I absolutely love what the CPC does to stand for life, not just for the baby, but for the mama. Mm -hmm. And uh, what Mark said about spreading the gospel, planting those seeds. Um, Lori has a story about a client that has been coming back for years. And in the, a time that she was really struggling, I'll let you share. Okay. Because it's just amazing, those tiny little seeds and the water, the growth that we can mm -hmm. see. And the, the, want and the, the want that they want to come mm -hmm. back and feel the love from us. Mm -hmm. And I kind of was, as I was jotting notes down, it's not always about the pregnancy. That's initially why people come in. Um, but this gal came in, um, her youngest was out of diapers. So she had a bag with just a few, just a handful of diapers, not that many. And she just said, I didn't need these anymore. I wanted to bring them in. But she said, I know that you, she said, I'm not very religious and I don't really pray, but I know you do. Um, and my husband is... Uh, just had major surgery, cancer surgery, and he's at U of M, and I knew you'd pray. So um, she actually was probably looking for Kelly, not me, because she knew her. <laughs> um, but she came in. I said, well, will you just come in and sit with me and tell me a little bit more about your story and what's going on? And so she did, um, and I prayed with her. And um, But it's those kind of relationships. She, she was honest. I don't, I don't pray. I'm not religious. But I know you do. And she knows that there is power in that, that there's a difference. She saw that, and that is what brought her back. And I just thought, that's what we want to be about. That's so cool mm -hmm. that that's what they remember in, a, in another crisis. It's not a pregnancy crisis. It's something else. They remember um, that people cared for them, people loved them, people spent time with them. It's amazing to, to hear how many of these young gals that come in, and they don't have anyone. And it's hard for me to, to see that because I have so many people I can rely on, but they, ha they have no one. And something I always like to tell them, I want you to feel loved when you come in, and I want you to feel loved when you go out because that's what brings them back. And not every girl that comes, um, comes with a crisis pregnancy. We have some young moms right now who are just young, maybe don't have a lot of family around here, maybe didn't grow up taking care of children, and they just want some education. Um, we, they want to know what's going to happen. What can I expect in, in labor? What can I expect during this pregnancy? Um, I, I want some more information on breastfeeding. So we have a lot of fun with them, just um, helping them learn, just watching them soak um, all that knowledge in, and just getting connected with other community resources, too. Um, our favorite days, at least my favorite days, are the days when the moms have finally delivered and they bring their babies back in. Um, it's just fun to, to um, rejoice with them, to celebrate with them. And we, I don't know if you all know this, but when they come back and they bring that baby back, we have this big gift layette that we call it, that we give them. It is um, clothes and blankets and bottles and just about anything that you could think of that a newborn would need. Um, and we have it all wrapped up in one of the handmade quilts or blankets that are made by our community members. Um, and just a way, most of them, a lot of our girls maybe don't have showers to get all those things. Um, or maybe, like I said, don't have family. And we just want to shower them. Um, just another way that we can show love and um, support for them. And so those are one of our favorite days. And we take pictures of the babies and hang them on our wall of babies. And so those are those are some of the most fun days. We also have hard days. Um, girls that despite all that we've shared with them um, and prayed for them, they still choose um, to abort. Sometimes we have girls that miscarry. Um, maybe they really wanted that pregnancy, but um, they had a miscarriage, and we uh, walk with them through that too. Um, just recently had a, a client who was so excited to be pregnant. She just couldn't wait, and at 34 weeks, she had a stillborn um, so those are, we have hard days also, um, despite everything that we try and do and help them do. Um, outcomes are not always as we would choose. Um, but we want to just say thank you again for listening. We could go on and on with stories, but I think our time is up. Um, and not every day looks the same. Um, Every day we go in, we have a schedule, and it usually doesn't end up looking like that. I don't know if I've ever had a day that looked exactly like the schedule, and probably all the other uh, nurse managers could say the same thing. But thank you again for being here. I, sometimes I will say I feel like the CPC is the best-kept secret in the area, and we don't want it to be a secret. So go out from here today, share, um, 
what the CPC is doing. If you don't know, come and talk to us and ask us. Find somebody um, who works at the CPC, and we'd be happy to share with you or share with a group. Um, I've had numerous girls come in um, and say, well, I just didn't know anything about this. That my, I wish I would have known about you during my first pregnancy, or where were you? Have you always been here? So um, I know there's a lot of people that know what we do, um, but there's a lot of people that don't. So go out from here and share, and if you don't know, um, ask us. Um, or get in contact with us. Be bold and stand for life. Yes. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Bobby Brown. I'm a nurse midwife, and I'm also a women's health nurse practitioner. And I work in the STI clinic side. And this is my wonderful, wonderful team. This is Tammy Rhodes. She's an LPN. She works at Bryan and Defiance. And Sarah Wagner, she's an RN. She works at Defiance. We'll fill in Brian when I need her. And Leonard, <laughs> Leonard is our most, Leonard Napsinger is our most wonderful counselor. We not only get the privilege of seeing not only hurting women and women that need just love. They need love from us and kindness and gentleness and caring because they're hurting. If they're coming through my doors to see us for the STI portion, they typically are in need of help, help with only Jesus can give them. And these three people right here do the majority of the counseling for, for Jesus, and you do. And I appreciate you more than I can even tell you. Um, one of the things um, over this past year We've evolved and opened a second clinic. We originally were in um, Bryan only um, for four hours and only taking appointments. And people would come in and they'd have to have an appointment, otherwise we couldn't see them. And I was only taking an appointment an hour. I couldn't really see that many people. And we ended up saying, let's, let's open up to walk-ins. In society today, it seems that people are easier to walk in to clinics to be taken care of. So we did that, and we said, hey, let's open up Defiance. So we go to Defiance now, too. So we're at least serving now two communities, and we're able to see people and to get them taken care of and just to pour the love of Christ. Last year, we came here the day of the banquet. We came, and we had an, just an amazing story. young lady came in and told us that she's 16 years old, and in the hour's time that Tammy and I, and I think Leonard was there too, took care of this young lady, she said she felt more love from us in that one hour than she'd had her whole life. That changed us. This young lady has come back, not to see or be seen in the clinic, but has come back to see us to get more love and just say, hey, I miss you guys. Or she'll contact us and say, are you busy today? Just because she knows that we accept her unconditionally. And that is what Christ asks us to do. He asks us to unconditionally accept people. So by showing that love has made a huge difference in lives. Um, Within the last month, Mark also was able to counsel a young man, and he accepted Christ, thank you, Jesus, in our clinic that day. And I remember that, and that was such a wonderful day. So we're able to pour love into people, and they see Christ through us, and they come to Christ because they see him, and they get what they need. So we've seen, taken like 399 phone calls this year, which is a lot, Thank you for the phone call getters. The clinics take over all those phone calls, um, and they send them to us. We have seen over 80 people in the last year. Defiance alone has seen almost 35, I think it has been. So we're we're growing, and people are getting taken care of. Um, I think the biggest reason why we see the growth in this area is health care. It's expensive. Healthcare is expensive for people. This is a free service, and it's also not findable. So if you have a chart like at um, ProMedica or at um, any Epic system, 
This is something that is in our charts, and it is a private private thing. We also have um, served in the last um, several months. We have had a couple that we have taken care of, and that couple, first the wife came, then the husband came, but we were able to pour into that couple. We've been able to give them the avenue of counseling, how to find a couple's counselor in their area, and now they are doing much, much better the last we had heard. So we hope that that their marriage is able to be restored. Um, so we're glad um, that lives can be touched, right? Right. We are. Um, one of the things that when I counsel our young women, especially the young women, the young men, Leonard and Mark, I just can't thank you more for what you do for these guys because the gentlemen you are able to pour into that many of them don't have that father. We have our father in heaven, but they don't have that figure to pour into them and believe in them, and they feel that from you. Thank you. Um, The women, one of the things I tell them, that you are his daughter, and you are chosen, and you are holy, and you are loved, and believe that. And so I hope that women walk out of my clinic when I've seen them and they believe that. I think they do. So thank you. Thank you. I'm Brock Rohr with Project Respect, and this is Taryn Myers. And uh, basically, I'd like to give you a quick flyover of what Project Respect is, um, kind of what we do. Uh, Taryn would like to share a story in conjunction with that, and then I'll kind of wrap up with um, what our next steps are, because we're pretty excited about that. Um, Project Respect is a five-day program that we go into schools free of charge, and uh, we are an abstinence education program um, that we go in and teach um, sixth through ninth grade students age-appropriate conversations and presentations. Um, We spend day one just kind of setting out some goals. Where do you want to be in five years, ten years, that kind of thing. Um, We spend a day talking about pregnancy, a day talking about STDs and STIs, um, a day talking about media and how media influences uh, a lot of the pressures that they're feeling. And then we spend the last day with them typically talking about boundaries, how to set some healthy boundaries for themselves um, and why that matters. And then we also do a two-day program called Safe Dates where we go in and we talk about safe dating and what that looks like and some warning signs of dating violence and some things along those lines. Uh, A lot of times we're finding that abstinence-only education gets a really bad rap in our culture. Um, Just this last week, uh, my wife and I were watching a TV show, and on the the whole theme of that episode was just absolutely bashing abstinence-only education, how it doesn't work and how it's not not basically workable in today's world and society. And um, honestly, it just kind of breaks our hearts as a team uh, because we've seen a lot of really, really good things come out of that. Um, Absence-only education has um, a reputation of being kind of hard-nosed, um, that we're kind of harsh, and we have that reputation of shaming students, and um, we feel like we're kind of the contrary to that. All right, which leads into me. I'm Taryn Myers, like he said. Um, I do a lot of the STD, STI days that we talk about it, which I love you guys, because I'm constantly sending kids your way, and they get really excited when they hear it. They do. It's free and confidential. They love that part. So anyway, um, I'm going to tell a quick little story. Some of you might have heard it before, but the most of you probably haven't, about an opportunity we had to serve a student and kind of what Brock was saying um, earlier in the fall. When we were in one of our Putnam County schools, because we do go to Putnam County as well, um, we came across Jana Minetti. She's one of our presenters. She had a, a student on day one when she went in, found out that this student who... I think had just turned 15, um, but she was 14, and she was about eight months pregnant. Um, she was a freshman in high school, so it's kind of starting out a little rough for her, but she was, she was a freshman in high school. She was due, I believe, in December. Um, came from a really, after talking to the teacher, Jana found out that she came from a really rough background. Um, her dad had never been in the picture. Uh, her mom was an alcoholic. Um, Her boyfriend was in the picture for now um, and supportive of her for now, but he was um, 14 as well. So it was very difficult. And we found out through further talking with the teacher um, that she was eight months pregnant but had nothing. 
She had not been to, she'd been to her doctor's appointments. Um, she was a high-risk pregnancy because she was such a small girl. Um, and she, the doctors had told her that she could really go any day at that point. She was very high-risk. They were considering bed rest at one point with her. Um, but she had nothing for the baby. She had no crib. She had no car seat. She had no blankets, no clothes, no bottles, no plans. She wasn't sure how she would even take care of this baby. Um, and Gina, upon hearing this, sent out an email to all of us after the class and said, can we do something for her? And so um, I knew that I was going to be in that classroom twice yet that week. And so I um, approached Jamie, the boss, and, and she talked to Mark. And we talked about partnering with CPC um, to provide for this girl. It's not the usual train that we follow when we're, when we're having a, um, in a pregnancy in the clinic. But this was an opportunity to bless someone who really needed to be blessed. Um, so we put together a package for her, um, just like they were talking about earlier. And I was able, I had the opportunity to be able to give it to her. Um, I came in with several bags and a, a blanket wrapped up and stuff and said, you know, this is for you. This is for you. We found out that you needed some help. You didn't have anything, and this is for you. And her face was just in awe. I mean, she didn't even know what to do with that. And she said, thank you, thank you so many times. And then when I went in the next time, I, I had made even more inquiries and ended up taking a whole nother load of things for her, like a pack and play and stuff like that. And when I showed up the second time with this second load of stuff, she almost started crying. I mean, she just could not believe it. And um, it was so such a blessing to me to be able to see this, to be able to see us, to be able to partner with the CPC and, and work this out in a way that, you know, we're on the front lines in the classroom talking to these kids and to be able to see it all the way through. She um, left that day. She didn't know how she was going to get home because she rode the bus and she had so much stuff. She said, I don't, I don't know how I'm going to get home with all of this stuff. And um, she said, well, I'll just call my mom. And her mom was an alcoholic, and we didn't think that was a very good idea to have her mom come pick her up. So the teacher actually volunteered to take her home. So that was even an extension. And the teacher's a believer and was able to take her home and deliver her with all of this stuff to, to her home. So that was just an opportunity that we had um, out in action in the classroom to bless someone. And we're so thankful to be able to go into classrooms and share with students and try to help walk through and process some things with them. Um, Jen, one of our team members, was sharing that a, a student from a local school had come up to her. She was there on a Friday, I believe, after the boundaries conversation. And this young lady had walked up to her and said, you know, previously I had been sexually active, but after hearing your message this week and after hearing of all the things, I'm just going to hold off and wait until I'm married. And we're just so excited about students like that that are willing to kind of step up and make those decisions, such hard decisions in today's world. Um, which brings me to uh, my last thing I wanted to share. Uh, we are really, really excited, and we can use so much of your prayer um, if you have time for that. Um, we are launching a school assembly. Um, this coming fall, we're going to be going into public schools and offering them an assembly-style format for their high school students, um, dealing with the conversation of sexting, um, sending and receiving inappropriate photos. Um, I don't know how many of you were aware of it, but it is an absolute epidemic in today's culture. I mean, it is unbelievable. Um, I guarantee your kids or grandkids, if they are still in high school, they have been affected by it or they know students that have been affected by it. And uh, our team kind of felt like no one is really talking about this very much. So we've put a lot of time into research. We've partnered with a local juvenile court and um, we're going to be able to go in and talk to students straight up about sexting and, and the psychological consequences of that and, and some of the long-term effects that that can have on them. So um, again, if you could be praying for that, we would definitely appreciate that. And also, if you would be praying as we go into the dark hallways of some of those schools and the light of Christ will shine through us, um, we're fairly limited in what we're allowed to talk about. Um, but just today, I was at a school and a little eighth grade girl came up to me and she, after class and she said, my mom told me that when I'm tempted to do bad things, that that's the devil tempting me to do that and I need to tell him no. And she was kind of looking at me like, what do you think about that? And I said, I think your mom's a very smart lady. I think she is right on with that. You keep telling the devil no. So if you guys could be praying for us with that, we definitely would appreciate that. Thank you so much. 2,500 years ago, over 2,500 years ago, the psalmist David 
said this, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. That was 25, over 2,500 years ago. Fast forward to now, and we have technology called an ultrasound. Not just ultrasound, but we've got 3D, 4D, high def. And those parts where the baby is formed in the womb are no longer a secret. And, uh, you know, with a lot of women, and it's well known that when a woman sees an ultra, her, her baby's heartbeat beating, um, she is more than 80% chance of her choosing life. So this is the most valuable, one of the most valuable things, items we have at the CPC, this electronic device. Because you can tell a woman till you're blue in the face that there's life in the womb, but we all know that a picture is worth a thousand words. So with that, we'll have... Julie Hagen and Lori Yoder present that beautiful picture in the womb. Hi, I'm Julie Hagen. Um, the program is going to get a little serious now because, unfortunately, many of my hours are dealing with a woman who's thinking about terminating her pregnancy. Um, couldn't agree with Dr. Hogan anymore that this is one of the most powerful tools that I've been using in the last 18 years to show women the reality of what's going on inside. Psalm 139 says, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. So every time I turn on the ultrasound machine, it's like opening up the Bible to Psalm 139. And thank you who's ever donating to pay the electric bill because I've never turned the power button on and it not come on. I've never warmed up the gel, turned that little thing on, it always warms up. Someone must have donated some money so that we could pay the electric bill. Thank you. Um, so Emma, so graciously, um, we get to see her little baby today. I hope you've been praying that the baby's dancing because um, I chose a model that is in the gestation where hopefully we'll be able to see the baby moving. So without further ado, let's see what the baby's doing. We always put the gel in the shape of a cross because Emma, we bless every woman that comes through our door and her baby. We love doing it. Okay, let's see what we got here. The baby's head is on the right. See the little legs on the left? Yep, the baby's awake. Oh, the ba the little guy just turned over. The little girl just turned over. So it's amazing um, the detail that we're able to see. And one of my friends, Mikkel, said what's really amazing is that God did not have to make... Um, the development of the baby, like this baby is 13 weeks along and you can see the heart right there actually. Um, but it's like perfectly formed, it's just a little human being, perfectly formed. So I thought that was really a neat insight that Mikkel had that, you know, God did that. Let me see if I can keep this on the baby. There's the baby's head, the median sulcus right there. Um, it's one of the measurements that Dr. Winter wants me to get is to do a measurement, a bipyridal of that baby's head. I measure it from one side to the other. So that would be a great one, Dr. Winter, right there, the median sulcus. Let me see here if I can. I'm going to, it's going to get a little grainy, but I'm going to zoom this in. Can you see what that is? 
That's the heart beating. Now let me see if I can do something here. The baby moved, that's why it's kind of quiet. But you see those little, see those little uh, tick marks on the bottom? That's the baby's heartbeat, okay? And of course, Dr. Winner wants to know the rate, so let's measure those for him. We start at one beat, we skip a beat, and we go to the next beat. So this baby's heart rate, if you can see in the upper right there, is 162 beats per minute. And Emma, I would expect your baby's heartbeat to be between 160 and 180. So that's right in the range where I would expect it to be. So the heartbeat, ladies and gentlemen, is a very powerful visual and auditory um, of the ultrasound, the part of the ultrasound. Um, I did an ultrasound last week on, it was not Emma, um, but it was a 17-year-old uh, girl in school, and she was just hardcore. She was terminating the pregnancy no matter what. And there was one moment where her emotions kind of turned and I saw a little bit of a little bit of tears in her eyes and um, it was when she could <clears throat> when she could hear the heartbeat that I just that you guys just heard so it's a very powerful tool <clears throat> okay let's see Let me get back to what I'm doing here all right and we do lots of um, we do lots of chatting with the baby baby's head is on the right Torso on the left, see the baby moving? <laughs> There's the spine area. You can see the little arms on the side. Baby's waving at you. <laughs> Doing all kinds of fun stuff there. <laughs> Did you see the little hand on the, on the bottom there, on the side of the head? It's very common for them to have their... This baby's really moving. It's hard to keep my transducer. It's very common for them to have their hands up by their face. And once I get a, I try to get a profile. It's not a very good profile. There's a nice head and the torso. But here's another really powerful thing, ladies and gentlemen, that happens every time I do an ultrasound. God has called me to be a voice to the voiceless. Give them a voice. And I feel like this is one of those little areas where I can do that. And I can print this picture out. And with her permission, and once I've built a really, uh, you know, intimate rapport with her, this isn't the first thing I do. If someone wants an abortion, I don't hand her a picture. Hi, Mommy, I love you. I do not do that. I don't want you to think I do that. But it's not uncommon for me to spend over two hours with a woman. And usually by the end of that, there's a little bit of softness that happens. So this is a very powerful tool. Um, and of course, not to be outdone. <laughs> Brooks, would you like this picture? <laughs> Oops. I can't type without gloves, and I certainly can't type with them. And I would print that out and give that to them. Very co other common pictures are high grandma um, or whoever her significant other might be that might benefit. So that's a really powerful, powerful tool. So the heartbeat, the measurements, um, and I only do the Doppler heartbeat in the second trimester, guys. Um, I don't, here's a cross section of the baby's heart. I don't do the Doppler or the audible heartbeat in the first trimester. Too much energy on too tiny of a baby. And so Dr. Winner only wants me to get the heartbeat in the M mode, which is this one, which is really boring after you've heard it. Okay, can you kind of see those little stitch marks over here? The little white stitch marks? Those are also the baby's heartbeat. So I can measure those. And I get... 154. This baby's just starting the second trimester. So that's right in the range that I would expect. <laughs> Sweetheart. 
And by the way, um, if anybody has seen the movie Unplanned, by the way, there's the thigh bones. <laughs> there's the little baby bum right there. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a cross section of the torso with the heart beating inside the chest right there. I could get that a little bit bigger. It gets kind of grainy the bigger. And then, of course, the head is here. Okay. So if you've seen the movie Unplanned, the baby that she saw is exactly this age. Right here. Every organ, every piece of this baby is completely formed and functioning. Uh, and uh, that happened to be when that termination that was shown was, was going on. There's another, there's some hands. <laughs> right there, waving at you. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. The baby was shaking his head, no. Do you see that? No, no, no. <laughs> There's a little, little hand again coming up on the top there. There's a hand here. So those are some of the, the most powerful images that I try to show this new little life to the mommy. And um, I know everybody's been asking for prayers tonight. I'm like, gee, I'm like fifth in line here. But trust me, guys, I covet your prayers because I have no ability within myself to have to change somebody's mind. But I count on the Holy Spirit to be present. <laughs> and I try so hard to hear his voice when I'm in there. So um, thank you for watching and thank you for coming alongside us. I'm gonna try to follow that without blubbering. Thank you. <laughs> We all have a story. My story unfolded almost 20 years ago. Though as I look back, I realize it wasn't my story. It wasn't about me at all. It's God's story. And it's all about him. A story of his goodness, his faithfulness, excuse me, his promises, and his love. A love so profound and majestic that we can't even wrap our human minds around it. This story illustrates the overwhelming and pursuant love of God shining through his people. I became pregnant at the age of 16. Fear gripped me, and you can imagine my many anxious thoughts that flooded my mind. What am I going to do? What do I know about raising a child? How can I ever tell my parents? What will everyone think of me? All of those pressing questions led me to the CPC in 1999. And that's when I met Barb. Barb, excuse me. I was four months pregnant. It was a sunny spring day full of warmth and one I will never forget. I walked into the office full of anxiety and not sure what to expect. But the instant I met Barb, my anxiety began to melt away. I felt the all-encompassing love of God flowing through her. I had never in my life met someone like her. Excuse me. I felt the genuine love of God in the gentleness of her voice and in the kindness of her spirit. There was no judgment. She was well, I was welcomed with open arms. We met every week, discussing the growth and development of my sweet baby boy. We prayed together for my baby and for me. A few weeks later, I was faced with one of the greatest spiritual battles of my life. 
that I didn't see coming. I was coming into a situation where all the prayers and love poured over me served their purpose. The family of my baby's father was not in favor of my decision to continue my pregnancy or to parent my child. They wanted me to have an abortion. They were ready to set up an appointment and escort me to the abortion clinic. They tried to convince me that I wasn't obligated to parent this child, that I was too young, that I was incapable of taking care of him. And since very few people knew of my pregnancy, they tried to persuade me to act quickly. They said no one would have to know and that I could go on with my life and all of this would go away. I was shocked, scared, and confused. Fear rose up in me once again. Evil came and met me face to face, trying to lead me in a different direction. It was at that point in time that I recalled all the time that I'd spent with Barb, all the prayers, the tears, and the love that she showed me began to flood my mind. God had placed Barb in my life when he knew I needed her most. I felt protected by his love and his truth. And as I look back and remember that day, I know that God was there revealing his love to me and showing me what was right. He saturated my heart with love. He gave me strength to fight the battle and the confidence to stand up for myself and my sweet boy. He gave me the courage to stand up for life. Sometimes I wonder, what would have happened if I had never gone to the CPC? What if I'd never met Barb? What if we had never prayed together and I didn't experience the outpouring of the Lord's love from Barbie and the CPC? I'm reminded of a verse in Psalm 32.8, and I know that my journey that included Barb and the CPC was no coincidence. The Lord said, I will guide you along the best pathway of your life. I will advise you and watch over you. I'm so thankful that God held true to his promise to guide me and watch over me. He was always there. He was with me from the beginning of my life, and he was there with my son while he was growing in the womb. I know that God's plan wasn't for me to become a single mom at the age of 16. It wasn't in an ideal situation. But the, worm, the words excuse me, of Psalm 127.3 are true regardless of the circumstances of his birth. Children are a gift from God. They are a reward from him. My Owen is one of the greatest blessings that God has given me. Though the enemy intended to harm me and my baby, God took a tough situation and used it for good. Being Owen's mom has been a privilege and a joy. And it was also the thing that drew me closer and closer to the Lord. God, who is rich in mercy, used Barb in the CPC to show me how great his love was for me. They showed me that I was worthy of his forgiveness, and he used my situation to draw me closer to him. I'll be forever grateful for the CPC and Barb's love and prayers that she poured out over Owen and I both then and now. (laughs) She continues to be an important part of our family. Barb and her husband, Bill, are Owen's godparents and forever friends. (laughs) Their faithfulness to the Lord is something to be admired and always sparks and challenges my own faith every time we're together. Barb's faithfulness to serve at the CPC changed my life forever. And I will always be grateful to God for using her in the CPC to guide my path. The CPC does indeed save babies' lives. God uses them and the amazing people that serve there to guide people like me on a path towards him. It is a path of love, goodness, and acceptance. Because after all, This isn't a story about me. It's a story about him. Thank you.
Oh, we don't offer any prenatal care. We don't offer prenatal care at Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood offers abortion, so they don't offer prenatal care. Prenatal care. These are the kinds of services that folks depend on Planned Parenthood for. And a president who will fight for prenatal care. Prenatal care. Um, and that, that is what we want to focus on. That is what is so vital. Thank you for coming Planned Parenthood. My name is Heckin' I assist you today. Hi, I was hoping to make an appointment for prenatal care. For what type of service? Um, prenatal care. Pregnancy care? We don't have prenatal care here. Planned Parenthood offers abortion, so they don't offer prenatal care. Okay, just abortions. Yeah. Unfortunately, no, we wouldn't provide any pre type of prenatal services here at Planned Parenthood. We're not a prenatal care provider. No Planned Parenthood does prenatal care. We don't offer prenatal care at Planned Parenthood. We specialize in abortions. You know, that's what our ultrasounds are for to see how far along the um, patient is. Planned Parenthood, we do yeah. birth control, you know, things yeah. like that, termination. We check for STI, but we don't do prenatal. We tell you you're pregnant, and we also tell her how to do the abortions. Okay, okay. So, uh, so we don't do any prenatal services No here. prenatal. No, we don't do prenatal services. I mean, it's called Planned Parenthood. I know it's kind of deceiving. Do you have OBGYNs here? We do not, no. Oh, you don't? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Which is a deceptive name, right? <laughs> I think the same thing. Or, you know, if you were looking at determination options, we can do that as well. Did you know that Planned Parenthood can take care of all your reproductive health needs? Whether it's an annual exam, pregnancy testing and counseling, prenatal care, we are here for you with high quality, low cost services. Thank you for holding. This is. How can I help you? Hi. I was wondering if you guys offer prenatal care. No, we don't. Not at the moment. Um, neither our Hampton or our Richmond office does. Oh, uh, we don't offer any prenatal care. Is there any other clinic you can refer me to? I don't know of anything. I would look around on the internet. You can try CareNet. I think they do prenatal care. CareNet? It's the oh, okay. first building on this group here. Um, we only offer family plan and services and abortion services. Not at all at Planned Parenthood. Okay, so not at any Planned Parenthood. They don't have prenatal care. Correct. Care. No, right. see, we, we don't see pregnant women as a way of giving prenatal care. Okay. We see pregnant women, um, you know, if they are considering other options. Like what other options? Like what do you see the doctor for? At this location? Yeah. Yes. Um, so at this location you guys do uh, medication yeah. abortion? Medication abortion. What pregnancy services do you offer? We only offer uh, termination services. Uh, we actually don't offer uh, prenatal services. We're not licensed to do so in Oregon or Washington. Do any of the Planned Parenthoods? No, in... we do not offer any prenatal care. Behind the closed doors of the abortion mills lie a host of secrets designed to keep the money flowing. My first guest knows those secrets from the inside. For years, she helped run, even owned large abortion clinics. Well, that is until God opened her eyes and changed her life. Would you please welcome a dear friend and a wonderful advocate for life, Carol Everett. Carol, so nice to have you. Thank you. So good to be with you. Yours is a powerful story of someone who was running abortion mills. How did you ever get into that business? I mean, it's not a business you go to college and say, I'd like to run an abortion factory. I was justifying my own abortion. I couldn't deal with what I'd done, but each time I sold another woman an abortion in some very sick, twisted way, if she was okay, I was okay. And I evolved into the abortion industry, and then I saw something else. I saw the money I could make. I saw the way to be a millionaire selling abortions. See, I don't think people understand that there really is an incredible profit motive 
in the abortion industry. Is that one of the dirty little secrets that we just don't hear about? That is the big dirty secret you don't hear about. It's one of the largest unregulated legal industries in the nation today. And they can kill women and no one reports it. I mean, after all, the family doesn't want to come forward. And of course, they can sock that money away and it's mostly cash, so we don't even know how much income tax they pay. Carol, one of the frightening things is that if you go to the dentist, he's highly regulated or she is highly regulated. That's true of virtually any type of medical practice. Abortion is a very serious surgical procedure. Whether you agree with the morality of it or not, it is a serious surgical procedure, most normally done under uh, anesthesia. It, it has risk, but most states have very little, if any, regulation. Still, unre still unregulated. And you remember when we uh, regulated abortion clinics in 2013 with HB2, all of the abortion clinics in Texas were unable to meet that slow, low standard for surgical facilities, ambulatory surgical facilities, except 19. 19 remained open out of the over 40 that closed. And today, of course, that's not true anymore. They, the law was not upheld, but women still heard the truth. And if you go into some states, literally abortion clinics are not required to have hot water. You know, you would think that the abortion and abortionists themselves and the people who believe that that's a wonderful thing would demand that there is uh, very thorough hygiene, that there's extraordinary medical capacity. Why not? Well, we're not talking about the top doctors. We're not talking about board certified OBGYNs. We're talking about doctors that can't work anywhere else. They leave, they're kicked out of a profession, they have nowhere to go, they start doing abortions. And since there are no standards, they don't have to be obstetricians, gynecologists, they don't even have to be family practitioners. And some states, of course, are trying to do lesser and let nurse practitioners do abortions. And Carol, when you were running abortion clinics, abortion mills, if you will, what kind of things would you say to people to convince them that they should have an abortion? We lied to them. They you all, lied to them? Yes, we lied to them. They all had two questions. Is it a baby? And we said, no, it's a glob of tissue, it's a product of conception, it's a blood clot, but we never said it's a baby. Yet when we went to the back, we had to literally reconstruct every baby as early as an abortion could be performed to be certain we didn't leave any body parts in the woman. Oh my gosh, I mean, that, that's chilling to hear that you go back and, and, and make sure that there's not a, a hand or a foot. So yes. those of you in the clinic, you knew full well this was a baby. You could see human body parts. Absolutely. And when one of my employees would come up and say, oh, this was a tough one, I would say, but we helped that woman. We helped that woman. We didn't ever talk about that. Did you baby. honestly believe you were helping? Or somewhere in your soul had you just decided, no, I'm not helping, but I'm making a lot of money? It's a hard question to answer. The truth of the matter is I was dealing with my own abortion, and if I ever admitted abortion was wrong, then I had to face my own demons, mm. and that would... That was beyond what I could do. You're sitting here today as one of the strongest pro-life advocates in America. What was the turning point for you? It was a man who shared Christ with me, and he asked me to pray a prayer. I prayed a prayer, asking Jesus into my heart, actually never expecting it to make a change in me. Mm. But when I went back to the abortion clinic, I saw those women crying for the first time. Mm. And as I sat down and talked to them, I was not saying, um, you know, I was, they had simple things. My parents would kill me. No, your parents love you. They'll be disappointed, but they'll stand by you. Would you like for me to go home with you and talk to your parents? Simple things. And at the end of the day, I was not celebrating the three lives I saved. I was saying I lost $75. And mm -hmm. I fell to my knees in the floor of that abortion clinic and prayed, Lord, if there is a Lord, hit me over the head with a two by four. Didn't know he had a two by four either, but he does. He does. <laughs> Yes, he does. I, you know, I think I've learned never to pray that prayer because I'll, I'll find out he's got one. Yes, sure enough. and it hits. And we were caught doing abortions on women who were not pregnant. Oh, my and, gosh. And that was my, that was my answer. Wow. Carol, uh, when I think about abortion, we always talk about the baby and, and we almost demonize the mom. But I, I've come to the conclusion from dealing with women who have gone through this, they need our love. They need affirmation. They're a victim in so many cases because, as I said in the opening, often they're talked into it. They're, they're persuaded and pushed and they're scared and they don't know what to do. How important is it that we also show love and compassion and tenderness toward that mother who's facing that very tough choice or even if she's made it? 
that's the woman that needs our help and our love in a way. I mean, think about it. Why is she walking through the door of an abortion clinic? She doesn't see any other way out. So we must love her, and our pregnancy centers across this nation do a great job of saving her and helping her, walking through that entire pregnancy with her. So we've got to love her. We need to share Christ with her. We need to be there for her. And you're living proof that there's no such thing as an unforgivable sin. You committed what many people would have said, but you're sitting here today. This is Dr. Anthony Levitino. Dr. Levitino is a board-certified obstetrician-gynecologist. Over the course of his career, Dr. Levitino has practiced obstetrics and gynecology in both private and university settings, including as an associate professor of OBGYN at the Albany Medical College. And Dr. Levitino, we'll begin with you. Welcome. Thank you, Chairman and members of the committee. Um, I only have five minutes, so I'm going to get right to it. Second trimester d &E abortions perform between roughly 14 and 24 weeks of gestation. Your patient today is 17 years old. She's 22 weeks pregnant. Her baby is the length of your hand plus a couple of inches. And she's been feeling her baby kick for the last several weeks. But she's asleep on an operating room table. You walk into that operating room scrubbed and gowned, and after removing laminaria, you introduce a suction catheter into the uterus. This is a 14 French suction catheter. If she were 12 weeks pregnant or less, basically the width of your hand or smaller, you could basically do the entire procedure with this. But babies this big don't fit through catheters this size. After suctioning the amniotic fluid out from around the baby, you introduce an instrument called a sofa clamp. It's about 13 inches long. It's made of stainless steel. The business end of this clamp is about two and a half inches long and a half inch wide. There are rows of sharp teeth. This is a grasping instrument. When it gets a hold of something, it does not let go. A DNA procedure is a blind abortion, so picture yourself introducing this and grabbing anything you can blindly and pull, and I do mean hard, and out pops a leg about that big, which you put down on the table next to you. Reach in again, pull again, and pull out an arm about the same length, which you put down on the table next to you, and use this instrument again and again to tear out the spine, the intestines, the heart and lungs. Head in the baby that size is about the size of a large plum, can't see it, but you pretty good idea you've got it if you've got your instrument around something and your fingers are spread about as far as they go. You know you did it right if you crush down on the instrument and white material runs out of the cervix. That was the baby's brains. Then you could pull out skull pieces. And you have a day like I had a lot of times, sometimes a little face comes back and stares back at you. Congratulations, you just successfully performed a second trimester d &E abortion. You just affirmed her right to choose. One more question, Dr. Levitino. Why did you end your practice of doing abortions? I did uh, over 1,200 abortions over a four-year period in private practice, not counting the ones that I did during my training. Um, I met my wife at, uh, during my first year of training at Albany Medical Center. We got married about a year later and found that we had an infertility problem. After years of failed infertility treatment and several years trying to adopt a child, we were blessed with a, adopting a, a little girl that we named Heather. And, August of 1978. Um, as sometimes happens in those situations, my wife got pregnant the very next month, and we had two children 10 months apart. Um, two months short of my daughter Heather's sixth birthday, she was killed in an auto accident and literally died in her arms in the back of an ambulance. Anyone who has children might think they have some idea of what that feels like, but unless you've been through it yourself, you have no idea whatsoever. Um, I know people find it hard to believe, but uh, what do you do after disaster? You bury your child and then you go back to your life. And I don't remember exactly how long it was after my daughter died that I showed up at Albany Medical Center OR number nine to perform my first second trimester DE abortion. I wasn't thinking of it as anything special. This was routine to me. Um, but I reached in, literally pulled out an arm or leg, and got sick. 
You know, earlier on I described stacking up body parts on the side of the table. It's not to, you know, gross people out, to use a simple term. When you do an, an abortion, you need to keep inventory. You have to make sure you get two arms and two legs and all the pieces. If you don't, your patient's going to come back infected, bleeding, or dead. Um, so I soldiered on and finished that abortion. And I know it sounds, as I said, hard for people to believe, but I'm, I'm telling you straight up my experience. You know, after over 1,200 abortions, first and second trimester up to 24 weeks and all the rest of it, and being very dedicated to it, for the first time in my life, I really looked. I really looked at that pile of body parts on the side of the table. And I didn't see her wonderful right to choose, and I didn't see all the money I just made. All I could see was somebody's son or daughter. And I stopped doing late-term abortions after that, and several months later stopped doing all abortions. What does a person have that a human doesn't necessarily have? One word. Yeah, you, you, you use the word. Now, now, now cut all that out and give me one word. Person has rights. And that's the difference. In fact, is there ever a time when a human being was property? Yeah, slavery again. All right? And that's a perfect example. They were not people. They were not people by law. Somebody simply said, that you're of a person of color, and you come to this country a certain way, and you're bought and sold, you are property. And it's that way because I say so. That's the difference. All right, now let's go back to Roe versus Wade. What is Roe versus, and this is why the answer to Jack's question, yeah, different states have different laws. And none of them make any difference whatsoever. None. None. What does Roe actually say? Roe says that in the first trimester, and this is why I explain trimesters, a state cannot restrict a woman's right to an abortion. She can have an abortion for any reason, no, just nothing goes, it's wide open. In the second trimester, Roe says, states can regulate abortion, but only in technical ways. You could make laws stating, for instance, oh, in our state you can only have a second trimester abortion in a hospital, or only doctors could do abortions. And that may sound strange to you, but a lot of abortions are done by non-doctors. In the third trimester, when patients, when these kids become viable, capable of life outside the womb, now if the state wishes, they can limit or restrict abortion or stop abortion entirely based on viability. Except, except a state can restrict abortion or prohibit abortion in the third trimester unless the woman's health is the issue. This is law. What's the next question you should ask? What does health mean? That's the way it's written. What does health mean? And Roe versus Wade did not define the word health. Now, how many people here have ever heard of Doe versus Bolton? Several of you. Good. Most people haven't. Everybody knows Roe versus Wade. For 99% of this country, the only Supreme Court decision they could name is Roe versus Wade. Okay. Doe versus Bolton was a companion case that was, that was ruled on the same day as Roe. And Doe did define health. Health includes a woman's physical health. Well, that's great. How bad does her physical health have to be? Didn't say. How about she's got cancer and she's going to die? That's pretty serious physical health. How about she's diabetic? How about she has mild renal disease? How about she's suffering from headaches? They're all her physical health. It also includes her mental health, okay? But how bad does her mental health have to be? Doesn't say. 
It includes her economic health. Whoa. How rich do you have to be to be economically unhealthy? Doesn't say. And my favorite, it includes her social health. What in blazes is that? Actually, in my practice, I did have one example, an abortion I did do, for, I, would, I would say would probably fall under the definition of social health if you wanted to use that definition. She was a teenager, she was 17, she was a senior in high school. She did not want to be pregnant for her senior prom. That's why she was there. This was her fifth pregnancy, her fifth abortion, in fact. Uh, but she didn't want to be pregnant for her prom. That was her reason, so she got her abortion. I did it. And this is where the politics comes in. A lot of Clinton was the last one I remember when he was president. There was a push to ban partial, what's called partial birth abortion, intact DNX abortions. And Clinton said, you know what, I will be, and this is where the politics comes, and this is why you have to understand this. I will be happy to sign that law as long as it has a health exception. What did he just say? I'm happy to pass any pro-life legislation you put on my desk so long as there's an exception so big the law is ineffective. So that's the answer to Jack's question. It doesn't matter if you know Utah says you can only do abortions up to 20 weeks. Roe says you can do them all the way up to the end of the pregnancy as long as you have a health reason. And the definitions for health are incredibly broad. So broad that they're, they mean nothing. Okay, so. Roe, actually, we always talk about Roe, but it's mostly been supplanted. At this point, uh, the one that really operates is Casey versus Planned Parenthood. And it was 1992, I think. At this point, and the problem was, and the court recognized this, the problem was Roe was based on fetal viability. Roe was ruled on in 1973. What has happened in fetal viability in 1973 was on the outside, if you were lucky, 28, 29 weeks out of the 40. But medical progress did not simply stand still. That's 45 years ago. Things have changed, and fetal viability has gone lower and lower and lower and lower to the point now that it's probably somewhere between 20 and 22. That's the outer limits of it, but that's where we're at. And even Sandra Day O'Connor once said Roe versus Wade was on a collision course with itself because of that. So the new standard, the one that operates now, is what's in Casey. And Casey basically says you cannot, no state may restrict abortion, may, no state may pass a law which, which, which presents and quote, undue burden on, a, on the right to abortion. Again, that's really, really vague. It's wide open because it's not defined. But that's where things are at. Please welcome best-selling author and professor Nancy Piercy. Nancy, I'm so happy to have you here. Thank you. Your book talks about things that a lot of people are afraid to even mention because we're living in a very politically correct world. So tell me, what is the most important message out of Love Thy Body? And so in Love Thy Body, I cut through the politically correct slogans and uh, give an expose of the secular liberalism that is being aggressively promoted in schools, Hollywood, media, politics. And in the process, I show people how they can um, debunk the negative stereotypes that are so common, you're hateful, you're bigoted, hmm. and instead reach out to people with a positive message. In the book, you say that secular liberalism destroys human rights. Give us some examples, and let's, let's start with abortion. Right. Most professional bioethicists today agree that life begins at conception. The evidence from science, from genetics and DNA, is just too strong to deny it. But their stance is summed up by a recent article that was titled, So What If Abortion Ends Life? What they're saying is, as long as the fetus is merely human, 
it's just a disposable piece of matter. Mm. It can be killed for any reason or no reason. In other words, merely being human is not enough for human rights. One of the things that I was hopeful that that video piece would do was expose a number of things. I know there were pieces that were maybe hard to watch or hard to hear, but that's part of the reality of what we're facing and um, the things that oftentimes we don't need or don't want to, to hear about, we need to hear about because they're important considerations. And this issue of life is way too important not to understand certainly what's at stake and the implications in so many ways related to that. Um, I want to conclude our program um, with an opportunity for you to partner with this organization. I hope that the information that is provided to you is, is such that it, it lends itself to recognizing the importance of the work that we do. Um, whenever there is um, the opportunity that we have to support any particular organization, we want to have a level of understanding of what it is they do, right? There's a sense of, um, do I feel comfortable enough with that organization, with the resources that God has entrusted me with? Am I giving that knowing that it will be... Um, handled in a way that's consistent with what the mission of the organization says, and it's consistent with the objectives that, and the values that I hold. And so I'm hoping that the opportunity that you had just to simply go through and hear stories and identify factual pieces of information with some of the video pieces, just identifying what we do and how we go about doing that. Um, and so it really is an opportunity at this point, to, to say, I, I see what you do, I recognize the importance of that, and I'm wondering how I can particularly uh, be involved with that. And so at this time in the program, again, we're going to ask you to, to be involved by virtue of supporting us in a financial sort of way. So when you came in, you got a program, and inside of the program was an envelope, and I'm hoping that each one of you received one of those envelopes. In fact, if you didn't, if you wouldn't mind raising your hand, and we will make sure one of the ushers will get you one, and if you need a pen as well, if you when you were coming in, that wasn't a part of the program. We'll make sure you get a pen uh, to be able to, to write as well. Um, there's just a couple of things that I want to talk about on the form itself um, and that I think are important considerations. The first one is just the, the, the top portion of it. So if you take it out and look at it with me, the top portion just identifies some information. Um, the name, street address, etc. that you can complete at the upper portion. Um, included with that is also an opportunity for you to, you to put your phone number and email address. There were several references throughout the time period that we were together on text alerts or email communications that just sort of give you some level of understanding of what we're doing at any given point in time. Um, the text alerts, which gives you an indication that we have a current situation where our staff is dealing with a person who's very abortion vulnerable or abortion minded. And so the, the aspect of the prayer portion of that is coveted and valued. And so on the top portion of this form, we'll give you an opportunity even on this form to, uh, to sign up for that. Um, it requires a cell phone and it requires us to know your, um, your carrier. So it's AT&T or, or Verizon, etc. Um, you want to include that because we actually send out an email that gets converted to a text and gets sent to your phone. Um, and so it, it's just a quick, again, opportunity for us to communicate something to you. So that top portion to, to complete. In addition, if you, if you say, man, I, I really want to in, get involved in even in an additional way by virtue of volunteering, um, you can identify by clicking there or checking there rather that you'd want to do some volunteer work. Um, and then if the gift that you want to give more specifically is designated for um, an honorarium or a memorial, there's an opportunity likewise to identify that on the top portion um, uh, of what's identified here. Okay, so um, hopefully you have a pen. You can complete that top portion. Uh, before we get to the next portion, there are two pieces of it more specifically, but I want to just sort of process this in a, in a specific way. I know most of the time when we come into organizations like this and we know that there's going to be some appeal and asking, there's a couple of things that, that happen. One, I oftentimes have a conversation with my wife on the way here just on how much I'm going to give, or there's a preconceived notion on how much I, I want to do. In some respects, I don't want to limit maybe what God would want to otherwise do in this moment. So if, if that can be erased for a moment or at least not think of it from the perspective of that's the, the extent that I'm going to do, 
So, so please don't allow that to only be necessarily uh, the, the limits on, on what you're thinking. The second piece that also sort of crosses my mind is when I go up and down a hallway and I see a whole lot of silent auction items that I'm looking at going, hey, that's great, and I write down a particular dollar amount, what I'm thinking in some respects, and maybe this is just me, I'm thinking, well, I sort of did my thing. I, I gave money toward the silent auction, and that means I don't necessarily have to do anything in the appeal. Maybe I'm alone in that category. My guess is probably not. That very much is intended to be an additional above and beyond what goes on in here. And so you're receiving some particular items for that. Maybe it's a fair value. Maybe it's a, you got a deal. That's great. Uh, maybe you paid a little more for it in, in terms of a premium. But please don't allow that to be the, the limitations under which um, you're sort of saying that that's the extent of my contributions for this evening. Okay, so that's the, at least a couple thoughts in relationship to this. What I do want to do is I really want this to be a time for you to determine, not somebody persuading you or arm-twisting you in any particular way. What I want it to be, in many respects, is you just going before the Lord and saying, Lord, what, what would you want me to do with this particular ministry? I recognize what they do. I recognize how you have blessed them. I recognize that this functionally is your ministry. And so I know that you have been gracious to me in terms of providing resources to me, and I want to be a good steward of that which you've entrusted to me. So as a particular means of saying to him, Lord, what would you want me to do and how can I do that in a way that honors you is really what I want uh, to occur. And to help us do that, I want us to pray uh, before we go through that second portion and really just a time for you as well as me just corporately leading for you to be asking uh, the Lord what specifically he would have for you this evening. So let's, let's pray, shall we? Father, we are grateful for your ongoing ministry. We're grateful for the work that you've done in our own hearts we're grateful for the redemption that is ours through Christ. We're, we're grateful that in your mercy you saved us and you redeemed us and we are your children and we're grateful for that. And Father, the responsibility that comes with being your child means that we need to steward everything we have in a way that honors and pleases you. Whether that's our mind, whether that's our body, whether that's our time, whether that's our profession, whether that's the financial resources, we need to steward those in ways that honor you because functionally they belong to you. We belong to you. We are yours. And so as opportunities for us to, to take what you have entrusted to us and, and to invest in ministries that are very much aligned with your biblical values is what we want to align with because that honors you first and foremost. So Father, I pray that in your mercy and grace that you would give the wisdom for everybody here to determine what that means for them more specifically and that they would act not on any preconceived notions necessarily, but they would act in response to what it is you would be leading them toward. And Father, give us the boldness and the courage and the, the resolve to do this in a way that functionally pleases and honors you. So we pray that that thought process and that decision, again, would, would ultimately give glory to Christ in whose name we pray. Amen. So the bottom portion of it, there's two particular pieces that I want to just walk you through. One is a one-time gift. Maybe you're here and you're saying, this is just one opportunity for me to, um, to provide some level of resources and um, to help them in what they do. That's great, and we very much appreciate that. There's no gift that's too large. There's no gift that's too small. I know that I only put $1,000 as the cap here. Trust me, there's the other category. And if you want to put a whole lot of zeros behind something, that's perfectly fine. We would be happy to do that. Janet will be just as happy to take that check and cash it as, as others. So if you're here and it's a one-time gift, that's great. And we very much appreciate and value that. You can identify a couple ways to do that. You can write a check and certainly um, include that in here. If you want to do that through an electronic transfer, um, you can do that and include um, a check inside of the envelope. Or if you want to do that through a credit card, Certainly, that's an option for you, and the specific information that we would need to, to process that is included. Know that once this is um, given to us, um, it's, it's um, not shared with anyone. Um, the information is confidential, and it's not going to go beyond, certainly, uh, the context of, of processing that particular gift, and then um, we will not uh, certainly do anything more with that. Nobody else will have uh, access to it. So, so know that. So the top portion is the one-time gift portion, and we're very, very grateful for that. You do recognize that this has been a ministry that's been going on for 33 years. Uh, and that means that when we have one-time events like this that help us sort of generate a sufficient amount of funds, at least to get us going, um, or to help us in any particular year, then three months, six months, nine months down the road, there's the issue of how are we continuing to provide some level of operations because we continue to do this uh, throughout the year. And God has been incredibly good to us, and um, I'm very, very thankful for that. 
that the resources that we have needed at any given point have been available and have afforded us the opportunities to pay the light bills, as, as Julie had made a reference to. It gives us the opportunity to make sure that we're continuing to do this on a regular basis. So the, the bottom portion affords you an opportunity. If you would like to be a monthly contributor, uh, more than just the one-time gift, it's an opportunity for you to complete that portion. Um, if it's a recurring gift, if you're already doing um, a, a monthly gift and you just want to renew that, you can certainly write renew new next to that, or if it's a new um, opportunity for you to do that, you can just include the information and we will certainly recognize that as a new gift. Um, all the gifts are tax deductible for sure. We are a 501c3. I do also want to just paint the picture because I know that there are businessmen in the room to understand just um, what we do. And as the administrator, part of my responsibility is to make sure that um, these sort of resources um, are, are continuing to flow in. The, the budget that we have for the, the pregnancy side of what we do is about $362,000. That's what it annually costs us to be able to provide the services. In addition to that, Project Respect is about $102,000 a year for us to be able to go into the classroom. So again, that sort of knowledge is helpful so that in tonight's opportunity to give, you recognize the, the, the extensive aspects of the financial involvement. We try to be good stewards of what you provide us. We certainly um, are responsible in terms of the board overseeing that. We have outside accountants that oversee that work as well. So the point is, is we want to be responsible with what you've entrusted to us. And I hope that based on what you've heard tonight and seen tonight gives you an indication um, that we're trying to do the very best job that we can with what you have decided to invest with us because this really is an investment. Moreover, you do recognize that at the end of the, our lives and when God judges us for what it is we do, we all want to hear him say, well done, good and faithful. But it is a function of how have we determined to do the things which honor him. And in the end, you are a part of the harvest that we end up having here because you provide the resources financially for us to be able to do that. So recognize the importance and significance of a card. And I know this is kind of the time where you're like, how soon can this get over because we're going to move on? I, I get that. But please, at the same time, just being honest, right? Um, at the same time, recognizing the importance and significance of it and just really asking God uh, to give you the wisdom to be able to make a wise choice in it. So I'm going to ask the ushers um, if they would um, not only come forward, but uh, uh, collect the offering.
One final matter of business uh, related to the auction items that uh, hopefully you won, right? So as you are making your way out, uh, there is, uh, should be a line of the items that you won, because it's probably a stack of them, right? So it's in um, numeric order, so based on a, a progressive series of numbers, it will have your particular bid number, the list of items that you may have won, and then a total. Um, that will be with that. So as you make your way out, that's one of the things. In addition to that, there were four items that were um, drawing items. And so you're wondering whether or not you won the drawing item, right? So um, I didn't put my name in any of them, so I'm not going to pull my name out in case you're wondering whether or not, wow, that's kind of... This first one is for Holiday Inn Express. Uh, Jessica Velez? Yeah! Yay, sister! <laughs> All right, this is for, um, there are two winners for this one. First of all, we'll do the breakfast. Me? J Jessica Velez. <laughs> it's rigged. I just prefaced it by saying I didn't rig it. It's not my name. <laughs> okay. It's like bed and breakfast. <laughs> All right, here's for um, the other meal. Uh, Nicole. Uh, Laco? Laco? Laco. Yay! All right. Uh, and that's for the lunch. All right, and one more. This one here. Uh, these are the gift cards. Doesn't that look like a good item? Gift cards, a 31 uh, bag, and a 31 bag. And the winner is Bobby Brown. Whoa. Good for you, Bobby. Very good. All right, I think that concludes the night. I'm going to ask Pastor Kent Knorr if he would come up, and he's going to close us this evening in prayer. Thank you very much for, for joining us. Would you please stand? Please join me in prayer. Our sovereign God, truly you are faithful from generation to generation, and you are faithful to ministries who honor you and we thank you for CPC Women's Health Resource and the 33 years that they've been on the front lines thank you for this very gospel centered ministry where they really provide what their tagline says help and hope and healing and I just pray for CPC in this coming year I pray that you would do immeasurably more than what we can even think or imagine I pray for Mark Pittman as he directs I pray for the staff at the clinics I pray for the volunteers and I think of 
the many women that they will be coming alongside and providing that help and that hope in the healing. Spirit of God, equip them, empower them. We thank you for the babies that were saved this past year. We thank you for the lives that were born again into your kingdom. We rejoice and we pray for this coming year for more babies to be saved and and more lives to come into your kingdom. I thank you for the heart of this ministry and what they do for this area, our communities. Thank you for how they touch lives because they allow your grace and your love and your truth to flow through them. Thank you for churches. Thank you for donors, partners. Thank you for everyone who is here tonight. Thank you that we can be in this pro-life battle together. And we do pray that one day in this nation, abortion will come to an end. We pray and ask all of these things in the mighty name of Jesus, our risen Savior. In his name, amen. You are dismissed. Have a wonderful evening.